Okay. I felt like don't stop believing might be a good theme for the talk. <laughs> <clears throat> so the, the, the title of this talk, the, this talk's title has gone through a number of changes. Originally I was going to do a skit to start off with the talk, but then I heard that the, the uh, time segments were only 45 minutes, so that got scrapped. Anyway, so uh, I've decided to call it Rubinius the fourth year, or if you will, the first senior year. <laughs> it's pretty amazing to think actually that this is the fourth year I've given a talk about Rubinius. Uh, I, I can't say that I would have ever guessed that this would be the direction that things went. But um, like, like all seniors, let's do a little recap of our, the glory of the last four years. Year one, freshman year. Oh man, you can't see that at all. Bummer. All right. So we were just a little sapling in the forest then. And really, the whole project was a toy. It was just kind of a fun idea. Um, and that's really the extent of what it was. Year two, sophomore year. Now we've really started going. But like all sophomores, they think they're the top of the heap. That's just how it goes with sophomores, right? Uh, if everyone remembers the talk, my, the title of my talk that year, that was the Rubinius 1.0 talk title. So we, we can see how well that's gone. So now we get on to junior year. All right, great. The contrast is good there. Junior year, we really hit our stride. Um, we really worked a lot on, on compliance that year. Um, specifically, obviously, working on Ruby spec. But we also took some redirections that year, some steps backwards, some steps forwards. We started redoing a bunch of stuff in C++. And year three ended up really being a lot of plotting. We worked on year three. We had a good idea of what the problem space was. And we were finally sort of moving in a trajectory that we were happy with. So now we're in year four. Year four has been uh, largely focused, a big part of year four has been focused on us working on the the JIT to really make running Ruby code fast. And anybody who was here for the last talk uh, heard all about LLVM, and uh, we're, we're using that, that tool as well, um, doing lots of things like hotspot detection and type profiling, which we'll get to in a sec. The big parts here are things like method inlining and block inlining, which is pretty awesome. And year four, largely, we've worked a huge amount on Ruby spec. We have a 93% pass rate right now. We run rake and rspec and rails. Uh, we run C extensions like sick and upgeary, uh, MySQL, Yagile, right? Yagile JSON, JSON, anyway. So, but really what people want to know most when I talk to them is when, when, when is Rubinius going to be done, as though open software is ever done? But when can I use it, right? So really we're talking about compliance and we're talking about performance. I guess I sort of skipped the whole beginning of this talk where I ask if anyone doesn't know what Rubinius is. So if you don't, you can raise your hand now. Okay. Um, so like I said, we, got a, we have a, like, about a 93% um, six, uh, uh, rate right now of passage. And we really, we've pa we're really passing and untagging more of those specs every single day. So we're, really, we're, never, we're never really backsliding on any of these at this point. We do have a few, a do, a few implementation things that we don't do. Um, whoa. I did. <laughs> okay. So, like, we, we have a whole bunch of stuff in object space that we don't do yet. We don't do ID to ref mainly because we haven't bothered. To, to implement it yet, and it, the, the how to implement it is significantly harder than the way that 1.8 or 1.9 can implement it. Um, you could talk to Charlie and I about all the trials and tribulations of doing that. Um, we've limited each object, right, and we don't currently yet support continuations. But really, that's the big sort of unknowns in terms of what we don't run, what kind of Ruby code we don't expect to run. Anything else? is sort of fair game at this point. If you've got anything out there, uh, I suggest that you, know, you, you give it a shot and you try it, because there's really nothing else that we expect. If it doesn't work yet, 
just that we, that's something we obviously need to fix. Um, a big part of this is the C API, which is the ability to use extensions that already exist. Because this has been uh, a, something that we wanted the project to do since the very beginning. Um, like I said, we, you, we, we internally we have SICK and we export no query and a bunch of other things. There are a few gotchas. So this is a, the part of the talk where I talk a little bit about uh, some sort of C extension best practices. Especially if you want to run them on Rubinius. Prefer a function over any of the R macros. Anyone who's written an extension will kind of know what I'm talking about. Specifically something like this. Um, we run across this occasionally and we don't support R basic at all. So uh, in addition, that's just something that, that's just one of those gotchas, something that you're gonna have to be aware of. Um, this is not a big deal, we find it rarely, but if you've got an extension you wanna run on Rubinius, this is something that you're gonna probably have to change. Um, oh, can you speak, is that green? Okay. Um, so another one is accessing the instance variable table directly. Uh, this is not just a Rubinius problem, this is a 1.9 issue too, so if you want your extension to run on anything except for 1.8, this is something that you're, you have to fix. Um, both Rubinius and 1.9 don't implement instance variables the same as 1.8, so that's just sort of how it goes. Um, same is true for basically anything in the RE header related to regular expressions. Uh, Rubinius and 1.9 have completely different regular expressions than 1.8, so those are sort of out of bounds in terms of what is available. Um, lastly, the env header file. Um, and these are a whole bunch of sort of internals that are exposed in env that are just, we don't have available, we don't have any plans to make them available. Um, anything that uses them needs to be worked around in a completely different way. So the upshot of this is try your gem, try your library, try your application on Rubinius, and really report your problems. There's nothing that's stopping us from fixing whatever is breaking your application we are happy to fix them because, unless they're one of the things I've already talked about. Um, so the one th big thing that people always wanna know about is where are we on performance? Because we have decided to implement so much of the system in Ruby itself, obviously we're sort of behind the eight ball in terms of performance in some ways. And so I, I need to talk about and address that a little bit. So there's the first part of this is what, what we write, so what the Ruby code is. So occasionally we run, run across code like this in the kernel just because someone had written it for, to get past something. And the, there's a, a huge amount of obvious inefficiency here. And this just boils down to normal everyday, how do I make my Ruby code faster? So looking at this, you might realize like, you know, this is kind of a silly way of getting the numbers zero, zero to 10. I really should probably do that. The other part that has really been where we spent a huge amount of time is how we run it, right? So uh, this is the part of the talk where we really get into benchmarking. It's looking at what, what can Rubinius do well, what it does it do slow, how can it run better, right? Um, and with benchmarking, there's always expectations versus reality. Looking at the results of benchmarking and trying to figure out what it means, and that means that there's always lies, damn lies, and stuff. So let's look at some benchmarks. This came out okay. Okay, so this is the, this is, I'll, I'll uh, you can't really see the numbers on the sides, that's okay. So this is a scatter plot of uh, running a set of benchmarks and the higher up uh, the dot is, the, the, how many times faster it is than 1.8. So you see, you see, oh, I could really use a laser pointer. You see that we have a, a outlier way up in the top, which makes this graph kind of hard to read. So let's get, <laughs> My man with the laser pointer. So let's get rid of let's get rid of that dot. Let, so I got rid of that one. Let's just compress it down so we can see it. We'll talk about that dot in a second. That dot is actually really important. So here we've got um, really uh, sort of it graphed, and you can see that Rubinius has got some really great ones that are tons, of, really tons faster. Mac Ruby is doing really well again because we're using similar backend technologies. That makes sense. So. Graphs in slides suck, so here's the summary of this, right? And uh, you, you would look at this and you would go, wow, I do. And you would probably go, 
if you were to just take, if I would present these and then just sort of close the book, you might go, wow, 12 times faster, that was crazy. 12 times faster, that means that all my Ruby code will run 12, my Rails app is 12 times faster. Hold on, hold on, buddy. That's 12 times faster on these specific benchmarks. So really what I'm gonna talk about here is sort of benchmarking for adults. It's <laughs> taking your benchmarks and looking at what they do and explaining to the reader how these benchmarks should be interpreted. And you really need context to interpret the results of these benchmarks. So what we're asking is what did we benchmark really, right? So this is a summary of those, the, those benchmarks. We call, one of them calls a method, one of them is just an empty while loop, you know, creating a block. Really what you would consider syntax elements in Ruby, the, the lowest sort of common denominator of functionality. And there's always the question, why just these things, specifically in the benchmark? Why are we testing these things? And the, the corollary to that question is, how do they translate? Like if I'm looking at how fast an I, I can access an instance variable, how can I extrapolate any results from that? So let me give you a quick analogy. Uh, we ran the RubyCon 5K today, and the winner was somewhere, Yarko was in somewhere like 16, 16 minutes or something like that, right? So he kicked my ass, in other words. Um, but if there's a race, and let's say two people, we'll go with myself here. Yarko and I are racing, and someone says, okay, we're racing to uh, three miles that direction. And Yarko takes off, and I go get in my car, and I drive there. <laughs> I win. Now, <laughs> is that a was I dishonest in that? No. The rules in this particular case did not specify how to get to that point. Now you might say, oh well you, oh, it was implied that you were, this was a running race or something like that. But there's context there. In, if we both had our running shoes on and I'm wearing running shorts and you know, like I'm eating a power bar, it looks like, and I run to my car, obviously I understood the context and I have decided to cheat. But let's say I walk outside and we're both standing next to our cars and it says, let's have a race over there and Yarko, Yarko takes off on foot. I might expect contextually that this is a car race, <laughs> right? So it's a question of context. It's a question of you're doing these activities. You need to know with which, with how to interpret the results because it matters how you got there. And in the Rubinius case, Ruby performance, those, the performance in those benchmarks that we previously did begats core performance. And that, by core performance, I mean things like array, things like string those core classes. Because we implement them all in Ruby, the functionality of those translates in some form to how the rest of the things trans translates into, say, how string ar append works or how array map works. Because array map is implemented in terms of those lower level features. But, so then you ask the question, well, this, the 1A performance here begats what? Well, because in all of those cases, all of those implementations implement most of their core in some other language other than Ruby, there's no way to take what's there, those results, and extrapolate them to mean really anything about most of the existing core Ruby classes and how they would perform. Really what we need is we need a lot more benchmarks. We need a lot more data. We need a, basically a better way of looking at the, those and a more honest way of interpreting the results. So these are a few ones that test, rather than those low level features, we're gonna look at specifically a few methods on some core classes. So here, <coughs> we're just gonna append this array uh, 100 times, and you probably can't see it at the bottom. I actually ran the benchmark 300,000 times for, to get these results, otherwise it's you know, seven milliseconds. So, so here was the results. And uh, great results, I, you know, really, really happy with these. Obviously, in terms of array append in Rubinius, doing really well. I was, we're all very sort of in the, in the mid-grade of performance there. Um, 1A largely being the outlier because those while loops and that kind of thing in Ruby becomes very slow, whereas everyone else can lower that to some kind of lower level construct, right? So we'll look at another one. So in this case, hash set. So we're gonna create a hash and we're gonna just fill it with elements. We do this 100,000 times. And now we see sort of 
more of what's going on in the system. We're getting a better picture about what goes on. Okay? In, every, in every other case here except for Rubinius, those all, the hash set method is not implemented in Ruby. So in 1.8 and 1.9, it's not surprising to see that they almost have equal performance. They have almost equal implementations of hash, of hash, of hash equals. Mac Ruby having a completely different one has whatever the performance of the core foundation class. Again, Java obviously is using some internal hash structure that the JVM has optimized the hell out of. And in the case of Rubinius, we see that really it's a pure running of Ruby code. So in this benchmark, what we have benchmarked is C code versus Ruby code almost entirely. So that's nice, you, but what you say in this is that's actually pretty good for Rubinius. We're currently almost only twice as slow as C code for running this benchmark. So let's look at another one. So in this case, it's just gonna be a hash access, right? Significantly less work than doing a hash write, lots, lots of less uh, memory used, all that kind of stuff. And again, pretty good results for Rubinius. Um, again, 1.8 is spending a lot of time because uh, of the way that its evaluator works, but everyone else ends up being, you know, sort of in the same ballpark. So we could see that the, again, and this is a trans, this is a comparison of C code in 1.8.1.9, Mac Ruby, Java in JRuby to pure Ruby code running in Rubinius. So in this case, if I, if I were less, if I had less integrity about the results of these benchmarks, I could say that Rubinius can run Ruby code faster than MRI can run C code. If I were to just taste the results of these, take, take these results and extrapolate from that. Obviously that's not an honest way of looking at these things because we looked at this previous one and obviously that's not the case. So there's a huge amount of work and a huge amount of data that goes in to be able to really get to an idea for the performance of these really large systems. So the conclusion here is that Rubinius is becoming extremely, extremely good at running Ruby code. If, if it's Ruby code that you want to be running, Rubinius can do it better than almost anyone at this point. And really what we're doing is we're playing sort of catch up in enhancing all of our systems so that our internal Ruby code that competes against everyone else's native code can really sort of pass muster. And that means that we're really, really pushing the envelope in terms of our abilities to run that code quickly. Like I said, in that one benchmark, clearly we're running, we're running Ruby code as fast as MRI can run C code, which is just phenomenal to me. So that more Ruby, doing so much of the implementation in Ruby is really a burden of our own devising. I wanted to do this from the get-go uh, because this was the way that I wanted to implement the actual system. And it made us be able to be compliant much faster because we can write Ruby code much faster than we can write that C code. But obviously we've got slightly slower core performance, or in some cases radically slower core performance. But for the most part, it's really starting to even out in terms of the overall performance of the system with a lot of those methods. Because really we're looking at, in this side, the Ruby versus C or Java in, that, in the JRuby case question. So there's, you know, I have gotten the question before, well, you know, why bother writing all those core classes in Ruby? Why not, if you really need the performance, can we just implement them in C or C++ or something, a Haskell, I don't care, just something that will, that will boost the, the, the performance of those things. And I, I, I say no for many reasons. And one of the reasons is that there's a huge upside to writing everything in Ruby and really to almost force us to endure the performance problems related to running all of this Ruby code. Let's go back to that slide from before. Uh, and in this case, I actually don't need Eric's help to point out where we're going next. We want to look at this data point because that data point is really, really interesting. And it really displays the direction that Rubinius is going and all the amazing things that we can do. So let's instead, we really need to delve into this one. We need, let's, so let's do, we're gonna do a full analysis of this specific benchmark and really get an idea for why is that dot up there. So this is the benchmark, kind of stupid. Like I said, a lot of these benchmarks are really silly. But really what we're doing is this benchmark was designed to see how fast could I call a method 
no, not doing it, doing a minimal argument checking, nothing in there. The idea is how fast can you just do a method dispatch, right? And this tells you something. It's hard to compare, but obviously in this case, Rubinius is doing something that is just phenomenal. So here's the summary. And in case I, in case you can't tell. Hundred and fourteen point eight times faster. The first time that I ran these and saw it, I thought bug, <laughs> for sure bug. There's no way that it was running that fast. I was just like, okay, fuck, there's a bug. I have to work on the JIT for a week because those bugs suck. And I called my wife. I was like, you know, I'm gonna have to, you know, come home late. I'm gonna have to really work on this thing. And I, so I, I was sure it was a bug. Turns out it was not a bug. It was a real performance characteristic of this particular benchmark. So let's look at the benchmark again, and I'll show you what exactly happened. So here it is again. Again, still stupid. <laughs> Hasn't changed from the last slide, still dumb. Let me, so, but if I refresh you on a slide that we talked about earlier under the year four category of this idea of method inlining. So here we have it right here. So the JIT is gonna kick in. So I'll, I'll walk you through sort of my thinking as I'm looking at this code and figuring out what goes on. Okay, so the, the JIT's gonna kick in on this run method and it's gonna look see the while, then it's gonna see all these method sends to M and then, okay, and so it's gonna go look at M, it's gonna see what it does and then, oh wait, you know what, I don't need to explain to you what it does. I can actually show you what it does. I can show you exactly what the inliner is doing in this case. And this is what it does. It compiles that method run, and then every time it sees that M, it's actually going off and fetching it, and it's sticking the body of M directly into there with a the guard every single time. So rather than having uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight method sends, you have eight integer comparisons. Because what happens after you inline is actually that the method looks like this. And then the compiler again goes, wow, that's stupid. <laughs> so you get this, and all of a sudden, all of that sending of, sending of methods and all that kind of stuff has gone away, and really all we're benchmarking is a raw while loop. And while in this particular benchmarking case, it's kind of stupid, you're not gonna write it, uh, M with nil and all that kind of stuff, but the ability to inline, the ability to see through all of that logic and to make assumptions based on all that inlining, in this particular case, is 100, makes it 114.8 times faster. And it's that idea that is extended to hash. It's extended to array, enumerable, range. Almost every single core class can be inlined into all of their callers, and they can be expanded upon. They can be, uh, all the redundancies can be reduced out. So really what you see is you see that Ruby code inline and become, to become that much more efficient as we remove the dynamic features. So where is the performance right now? For many programs, Rubinius is much, much faster. If you've got an M that returns nil, for instance, <laughs> I will blow your socks off. But consequently, ah. consequently, there's many programs that are a little slower because we have so much more Ruby code to run to just do something simple like, say, um, a good example of, of something that's uh, quite, in, you know, the next slide here, some programs are quite a bit slower. Something that's a lot slower right now is, say, array unpack, something that's very platform dependent. Array unpack and Rubinius is huge. It's all of this Ruby code because the C code is literally um, you know, 10 or 15 pages of C code to actually handle all the cases that unpack does. And we're doing that all in Ruby now instead of all in C. So it's, it, it, it takes time. But as you can see, we're really starting to get there. Um, and we're getting really confident in the level at which performance is and the level at which the compliance is. So 
Let's talk about releases. So we did a 0 0.13 release um, last week, Brian? Last week? And the big thing about this was we started working on it about a month ago, month and a half ago, and we turned the JIT on by default. So previous to this, the JIT had been a, 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 an optional feature because we weren't sure that it was solid. So we turned it on by default, and we have yet to actually get anybody having a JIT crash. So the JIT is on by default today. So that, that makes a huge improvement. Anybody who downloads Rubinius to try it out right now might see, oh my gosh, this code is all of a sudden four times faster because of that JIT. We did lots of fixes. So it's our senior year. We got to decide what we're doing, at, we're doing after high school, right? We're going to go to college. What are we going to do? We're going to go to Votech. Are we going to just drop out, you know? <laughs> you know, th things a senior has to do. So we've made the decision that we've come this far, and we feel confident about it, that we're going to announce today that we're doing the 1.0 RC1. And that's going to be coming out next week, uh, mainly because we did a release last week. We need to kind of get our ducks in order. We've got a few outstanding fixes related to how, to, how you can install Rubinius and a couple of other crash bugs that we fixed in the last week that we want to get out before we do an RC1. So let me just set, again, like I did with the benchmarking, it's not a lot of fun, but the idea is we're setting expectations. I'm going to set your expectations for 1.0 RC1. The expectations is that it runs Rails 3 out of the box that you can run Rails 3, you can set up a site, and you can use it right there uh, without having to twiddle things. That's our expectations for RC1. Huge performance improvements over what we've done in the past, if you've ever played with Rubinius. The, prog the, the project has gone through such undulations in performance and functionality over the last four years that we're really at this sort of pla amazing plateau right before we sort of reach for the next, the next performance gains. So. Uh, you'll see a lot of, you'll see, you've seen a lot of performance improvements, you'll continue to see them throughout the RCs, which is, comes to the other thing, which is that there'll be, we're going to do an RC every month from now on until 1.0 is out. And the big question was, w when do you feel like you're ready to, to run, w you're ready to cut the 1.0? And that's kind of up to you guys. Uh, if we all of a sudden don't get any more bug reports and it's running all, all of our stuff, we're going to go ahead and release a 1.0. But if you want to be using Rubinius and you want, it has failures, it, it doesn't work with your gem, uh, I can't go out and test all the gems. So it's your responsibility to come to me and say, hey, I've got my awesome big library. It does metaprogramming to the 12th degree and it doesn't work on Rubinius right now. Get it in now so that we can get it in, a, in that 1.0 RC. And therefore in 1.0. So I know that uh, it feels like I've been given the same talk for four years, and to me it does too. So uh, I'm happy that we're now really at this stage that we can talk about this and really really push the, the state of the, the Ruby performance sort of to the next level. So uh, with that, I will take any questions. Yes? Um, What's sort of potential to migrate the Ruby code and Rubinius to other dist other uh, VM implementations? Oh, so the question was, um, what's the implications for migrating the code from Rubinius to other implementations? Um, could you give me an example of an implementation you'd be thinking of? Sure. Let's say, uh, for instance, um, uh, instead of some of the Java code in JRuby, uh, replace that section with the, the Ruby code that comes from Rubinius. Sure. It's just that it's for so a single point of maintenance. Sure. So uh, in this case, it was, you know, well, what if I wanted to run some of the Ruby, the Ruby code that's in Rubinius on top of, you know, sort of with, instead of a class in JRuby or something like that for fun. So the way that things are structured in Rubinius is that we try actually really hard to keep things segregated so that we have a, 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 a bunch of different directories that contain the actual Ruby code with certain expectations for each directory. So we start off with bootstrap, and we don't expect anyone else except for Rubinius to run that. Um, and then there's common. The idea is that 90% of the code for the entire system is in common and could be used by anyone. There are certain things that are expected to exist already in order for you to run common. And we haven't, it's been a while since we went through and actually made the list of, 
okay, you need to have a method called this that does that. It's basically, that list is how to build your bootstrap. Um, and then we have a couple of other phases. There's a platform phase in there that's, again, Rubenius only, and a delta, which runs after comment that is sort of fix-ups that if you uh, have an implementation that you want to override an existing method that was in common, you, put, you can put it in a delta, basically. Um, we did a lot of this work uh, with the gemstone guys because they, want, they are using uh, parts of the Rubenius kernel. Um, and so we went through and sort of devised most of those directory systems. Um, we had some of them in place, but we kind of revised them with them so that they could have a, a nice way of getting that code in and out. So um, it shouldn't be too bad. Um, if it's, uh, if you wanna try it and you feel like there's a whole bunch of things that are really convoluted, it probably is just us being lazy and needing to go through and be like, this doesn't need to be, this can't be in common, this needs to be over here. That, that, that happens, you know, so we, we have a, a round of cleanup that we would need to do and we're certainly welcome to do that. Uh, let's go with Josh. Um, it, if we want to be testing our stuff on Rubinius, what's the best way to get Rubinius and be able to run our stuff on it? Very good, thank you. So the question was, what's the best way to get Rubinius and to run your code on top of it? So um, you can, we, if you don't want to, you can obviously just check out the Git repo and then do configure and then rake, and that will build it, um, and uh, that will build it and you'll be ready to go. Um, and then it will be sort of as bin RBX. Um, for, one oh, for RC1, we're going to be fixing the installer so you'll be able to install it. Um, we'll probably be turning the JIT, the compiling LLVM in by default, which doesn't happen right now. So um, you'll be able to just, again, either clone it or get the, the, the individual tarballs from the website. So it should be, we're, we're working really hard to make that process as streamlined as possible. It's been kind of up and down in years past, but we're trying to really um, really get it sorted out so that it's, it's, it's easy. Um, I suspect that we'll probably do some kind of binary packages as well for RC1 so that it's that much easier for people to download it and try it out, so. Brian. The directions will be on the website and that kind of thing. Thanks, Brian. Yes, screen shirt. Uh, you said you expected to run uh, Rails 3. Yes. Well, that's your target for RC1. Do you expect it to run previous versions of Rails as well? Um, Yes, so we have been, just because I, my, de my desk is actually next to the Yehudas now, I actually have a desk, which was a really big deal, but engineer are moving offices, so I have a desk finally, but um, so, but I digress. Uh, so I sit next to Yehuda, so we've been working on Rails 3 specifically. Um, we, we have run Rails 2 in the past. Uh, we've, we've regressed from running it again, but I don't see any reason why we wouldn't run it now. Um, most of the stuff related to running Rails has to do with active support, and active support hasn't changed radically between Rails 2 and Rails 3, so um, if there are bugs there, then we want to fix them. Um, th that was really to set expectations so that um, you, you know that that is the good, that is the, Rails 3 would be the path, but I don't, if there's bugs that we don't run Rails 2, 3, then I don't see why we wouldn't fix them as soon as we could. So I'm behind the pole over there. Oh, yes. Um, all this is based on Ruby 1.8, right? Yes, it's all based on Ruby 1.8. So Ruby 1.8 and it's always been not in the plan, so not for a long time. Oh, okay. So I didn't, I didn't cover versions. Um, so we, we uh, pushed forward, and Rubenius is now based on 1.8.7. Um, as for 1.9, um, we have a plan that we've been talking about how to actually do it. We had a couple of contributors who were working hard on actually adding all of the features in 1.9 to our kernel, just in normal Ruby code. Um, so we have a, a plan for that. My guess is that we will not do it for 1.0, um, but it is definitely on the, the roadmap of things to do. We wanna be sure that we don't do it in a way that sort of upsets the apple cart of 1.8 of support. We don't wanna all of a sudden just regress and have all these failures and all these problems related to 1.8 because we decided to work on 1.9. So it's, we have to figure out how to do it in a fairly separated way, so. Charlie? Um, I just thought it was interesting to talk about the JRuby side of the previous question uh, about reusing the Ruby stuff. We would love to reuse the Ruby stuff uh, just so we want to maintain much larger, much more complicated Java code. And actually the new compiler work that we're doing, one of the questions our compiler guy asked us is, Okay, now I want to start inlining things like a 
array each. And I have the IR for that code, and I have the Ruby for that code, or whatever. And I'm like, oh, well, that's, that's implemented in Java. We, don't, we can't give you that. So we have actual use case, and a guy, a compiler guy, who's all set to start taking more Ruby code and using it to optimize JRuby's Ruby runtime stuff, too. And we'll be working close with Evan to make sure that all the tricks that he's using now in his compiler, we can translate over it and do the same stuff on JRuby as, as much as possible. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to as we're starting to hit this 1.0 release cycle stride, um, I suspect that there will be a time, a time will come where the, the Rubinius kernel will form some sort of standard expectations of how Ruby, Ruby code is meant to function. I know there's a number of people out there that actually have begun to be using the Rubinius kernel as their documentation for how Ruby methods work rather than RI so that they can actually go and say like, oh, th what does this method actually do? Oh, it takes five parameters and then it does six different things with them based on 12 different variables. So let me go look at the Ruby code in Rubinius for it instead of looking at the RI to figure out, then I can actually see the logic and kind of go from there. So that's a, uh, definitely the cleaning up and the sort of um, sanitizing of that code uh, is probably high on the, the list of things that we will get done in the soon term. So, sorry my talk wasn't so comical this year, but I felt like there's lots of important things to talk about. Paul, yes. Do any of your benchmarks look at um, garbage collector performance? Um, yes, actually the, um, the question was, do any of the benchmarks look at garbage collector performance? Interestingly enough, the hash write one that I, I talked about earlier is about 50% garbage collection uh, because of it's run about 10,000 times with a hash, making a hash with 100 keys. Um, that one is actually uh, not almost, it, the runtime of the code is so dominated by the garbage collector in that particular case um, that it's kind of comical. But I leave it in because it's this is sort of a specific case. So yes, in that, in that particular one. Yeah? Uh, so this is probably low priority, but what are your thoughts on getting rid of the global interpreter lock? Sure. So my question was getting rid of the global interpreter lock. So um, when we switched to um, running with the C stack and running with native threads in Fed Rubinius, just for time's sake, we went ahead and used a global interpreter lock. So we're basically using the kernel for multiple threads and thread switching, but we're not actually letting them run concurrently. Sort of a, the previous talks have talked about this particular issue. Um, we ha actually have it on the sort of to-do list. It's towards the top, actually. Um, it's not super difficult in Rubinius because we actually don't have nearly the amount of code in a la unmanaged language that other people do. So um, it's sort of a case of really just going through and auditing most of the code base and figuring out how exactly the lock should be structured rather than having just one of them. We have N of them. Um, earlier this year, I actually had the distinct pleasure of talking with John Rose, who's uh, one of the sort of preeminent JVM engineers. And he had been, he was on the hotspot team for the JVM when they, back in the early 90s, when they migrated from green threads to native threads. And so I kind of picked his brain about how exactly they did that, all of that process. And so that's sort of the same process that we'll be going. It basically has to do with, um, you start with one lock and you decide, okay, I want, I want two instead. How do I make just two locks over everything? And you kind of move from there. Um, but it is definitely high up on the list. We have to decide if, I, I, at this point, it's unlikely it would be in a 1.0 release. My guess is that that would be something that would be in a major release, the next, the major release that comes right after 1.0, which would, <coughs> oh man, I really hope that it does not take as long to get 1.0 out, or 2.0 out, that it takes 1.0 to come out. So, otherwise, yeah, I'm going into gardening. <laughs> Bill. What's your ratio of Ruby to unmanaged code, as you call it? Uh, what is the ratio of Ruby to unmanaged code? So we can, we can take a look. No, don't do that. Keyboard? Keyboard. I think I already know how to use computers. Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's 
go through some journey again. Um, okay. So. How's that? Okay. Um, okay, so this is sort of the, the, the structure. Um, so that is, you can't see that. 28,000 lines or so of Ruby code that's in the kernel. Or, yeah, in the kernel. Oh yeah, so I am. Thank you. So there's about 7,000 lines for the bytecode compiler. This is riveting, I know. <laughs> Watching me type. Wait, what am I doing now? Okay. Okay, so it's about 50-50 um, right now. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, a lot of this is, there, there are some things in here that we could clearly make, go revert and go back to having Ruby versions of that we haven't really done an extensive audit of. Um, a lot of these are things like, um, you know, how the method tables work and all that kind of stuff. Stuff that you unfortunately really can't have in Ruby unless we were to do some sort of translation from Ruby to C ahead of time, which is sort of a, a, a whole nother ball of wax, so. Anyone else? Yes? I'm uh, curious what, um, what your process is for getting in the features that you don't have, like the call CC, you know, what your determination um, yeah, so the question was, you know, how are we going to add the, 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 the features? Okay, so this, how will we add features that we don't have right now? So there's sort of two different kinds. There's the features um, to Wax from Feldian. There are features we know we don't have, and there are features we don't know we don't have. Um, and then there are features, yeah. So the features we know we don't have um, are split into sort of two subgroups. Either stuff that we really need to do now, in which case there's there, those things are almost always on sort of the top of the queue. Like we don't have this implement, we don't have that implement. And those do those things right now. Um, call CC and the object space stuff are lower because simply they're not used in a significant amount of code, and they don't have a real big impact on our com on our completeness. Um, obviously, those things that we don't know we don't have are philosophical. So, I mean, we'll get to them as you find them. We have to know them to do them. So, yeah. Anyone else? Okay, thank you.